Some are pointing out the fact that men seem to be much more likely than women to snap and go on a killing spree like this one. I talked earlier with Alan Lipman of the Center for the Study of Violence about that very issue. Well, it's true, and it's true across cultures. If we look, at, after all, at, at what just happened in central China with the, uh, with the stabbings, you know, again, it was a male, and in Germany, and in Norway, and so on. And there's both a nature piece and there's a nurture piece. In terms of the biological underpinnings, you know, we are all flooded with uh, testosterone. And testosterone is a hormone that causes young men to be aggressive. Now, in normal functioning, um, that causes someone to go after the goals in life, uh, to go after the jobs that they want, and to seek the, the family that they want, and so on. But in people who have mental illnesses, it can have a distorted function in that it interacts with a chemical in the brain called dopamine, a neurotransmitter, which also makes people very aggressive. And in the people who have the disorders who commit these crimes, they have too much. Okay. The other thing is that uh, a number of these incidents have taken place at schools. Why schools? Why not soccer stadiums or football stadiums or shopping centers? That's an excellent question. Yeah. The key here is that there are two parts to these mass shootings, essentially. There's the underlying illness that makes a person much more likely to be violent. And then there's a trigger, which is like the match to the flame. And the trigger is some kind of social incident, like a romantic rejection, or a failure in school, or a social rejection. And schools, for kids of this age, uh, late teens and early 20s, as I mentioned, they are hotbeds of social activity and social conflict. So this is where the triggers, the romantic rejections, the problems with social status, the failures with grades, are most likely to happen. And of course, adding fuel to all this is the fact that in many instances, as we've just seen in this instance in Newtown, that access to weapons is relatively easy. Well, this is the, the second uh, piece of it, which is, I think, uh, tremendously problematic and which we absolutely need to change. And I think this time, in all of these incidents that I've seen over 20 years since the early days at Yale, I think we just might change it this time. The fact of the matter is this. If you have someone who is much more prone to violence than you or I, by virtue of this circulating dopamine in the brain, they are so filled with rage and anger, they are ready to strike, they can hardly prevent themselves. If they have easy access to a Glock semi-automatic pistol, or a Sig Sauer pistol or a Bushmaster rifle. They can just lay their hands on it. It's too easy to move from thought and emotion, from rage to action and reality. But if we put even reasonable limits, such as a 10-day waiting period, for example, or other kinds of restrictions that would cause time to allow either an intervention, a treatment intervention, so that they are not so psychotic and enraged, or simply time to pass so that that peak of anger, that asymptote, begins to come down. That alone, that combination, that lethal combination of rage and easy access to weapons would begin to become separated. And this is where we need to begin in this nation. This is where the national dialogue needs to begin, mm -hmm. is right at that intersection identifying mental illness, knowing how to intervene, and making weapons of mass killing, large capacity magazines that can hold a hundred different rounds, this sort of thing, much less accessible so that they can't immediately act on those violent impulses. Okay, so we're going to have to leave it there. Thanks for joining us. It's good to see you again.